Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Truth Warrior. Happy to be here with you today. It is June 18th, 2020. The world hasn't ended quite yet, but there's definitely some meltdowns going on in society and also at in the upper echelons of power in the world, as we're going to be discussing here. Um, Michael, welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, you contacted me to say you've got some very interesting updates to share and some ideas to share. Uh, there seems to be some things that people are maybe not paying attention to that are going on behind this whole story that we're seeing unfold. And so uh, it's good to have you here to break some of that down for us. So welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And yeah, there is a lot going on that uh, and we called it. I mean, go back to an interview we did, I think as early as March, and I called this rioting in the streets. There was always the pink hats stretching back before 2020, but I specifically talked about the thugocracy, the fact that if gangs hit the streets, it'll be something that was hard to roll back. And of course, now we, you know, they're, 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 they're searching through the constitution. Every state is having its own uh, issue with that. Some are completely uh, showing their petticoats, their support of the nihilists and the rioters who are basically criminals and murderers at this point. And then there's some others who still retain a modicum of sanity going, no, I don't think we want this taxpayers this word that you know rarely appears anymore. Yeah, because if you use it, then obviously you realize, which you should already realize, that taxpayers want law and order. That's why we have it. That's why we've had it. It's like trying to take the pepper out of the dinner dish after it's been cooked. It's like trying to take the scaffolding out of a building after it's been built. But the airheads obviously don't, you know, and again, once you see the mad is mad, all of the problems of the world are solved, says Mark Twain. Right. See insanity as insanity and save yourself all the effort of trying to work it out, says Vernon Howard, right? Precious golden words. So, but no, it's, it's, uh, that level shouldn't be bothering people like us, right? It should be bothering the people who try to naysay conspiracy, but let's not go down that road anymore. We've already clamped that, I think. But we did call it the thuggery, this kind of thuggery. We called it months ago that this might be one of the consequences of the lockdown doesn't cease soon and here we are right in the middle of it you know and, and it's hypocrisy of non-social distancing you know i mean this is this is for airhead so why waste even time commenting on it right but what we've been doing since the beginning is tracking this edifice of communism and i just wanted to say a few words not 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 going into great detail but you know again we have to treat a lot of what we say never forgetting that this may be completely new to people we already know that there's a gigantic percentage, you're talking you know, up to 50 and more percent of people who for the very first time are checking into politics, uh, you know, uh, because, well, the big game has been canceled, you know, and hopefully for better reasons than that. But no, let's, let's be frank, because the daily routine is on lockdown, because the game isn't on, right? People have turned from recreation and are now actually getting involved in some of the political activity. You know, that's a fact. So, Comments that we have done have been nicely catered to that type of person, and today will be no different. We've talked about this Leviathan of communism, and I thought this would be a good place to dive in and, and uh, dissect a couple of key things that's known to deep students. So, you know, again, apologies for those who are familiar with today's content, but again, we have to always be willing to meet people halfway, to not imagine that it's all, you know, that every listener is up to speed on some of these things. Uh, I'm constantly aware of this. That's why I put links to certain other podcasts, right? Uh, UK column jumps to mind, the work of Brian Garish. Go over there, folks, you know, uh, check that man out every day. Of course, you know about your Tucker Carlson. So, but less people are aware of UK column. That's Brian Garish, you know, um, excellent show comes out every other day you know uh very vital information uh because he has experts on that i've gone that much deeper and can tell you about history a lot of it's very historical which i particularly like so i have to plug that you know so but i put i put the links like that you know on facebook and in other areas because these are the kind of links that as i said there's a new demographic coming to town so they're the links that can help you if you're new to this but they're also good links for those that you can send to other people who may be more open-minded you know, um, pe people in your family that may now be a bit more receptive. Yeah, but you don't want to throw them in the deep end, right? So by sending them UK column and Tucker Carlson, you have a better chance of seeing them come across. 
you know, as well as, as the ones we've done on your channel as well. So uh, always be sensitive to that, you know, uh, because we have a lot of millennials now and all the rest of it. Uh, and I believe that, you know, our content really opens a lot of portals. It opens a lot of vistas into the reasons why things are happening. You'll get a lot of chasing headlines and explanation or what not explanation, you get description. Description is not quite the same thing as explanation. You know, so the work I've done is very, very wide. And it also includes looking at both sides, right? I know what the, the socialist narrative is. I know what the communist narrative is. I know what the opposite side of the narrative is, right? That's coming from a nonpartisan point of view. And even if I was to take a side, yeah, I'm taking a side, but I still know what the direct antithesis of that side is, you know, uh, by and large, right? And I think that's very, very important for us to share, uh, you know, for, for us to explain why this modern meltdown is happening. And the tack we'll take today, I think, is very, very interesting because what's really going on, in my mind, uh, is also that uh, we've said it before in other ways. We've talked about communism with a large C in terms of the Bolshevik, you know, mindset and some of its hybrids, like Ismail. Yeah, how'd that happen, right? Well, check it out. Do you know the history of Iran? Do you know the history of uh, Islamo-communism? I guess not, right? But the thing is that once you discover some of these things, what's also pertinent to this is that even if the vile, right, edifice of communism in that more capitalized sense was to fall, unfortunately, we're not free. Still, in, in terms of, you know, the world problem as it affects politics, economics, and daily life. Because we have hiding within that edifice, that great cloak of the red communism, the red threat is socialism, right? And socialism needs to be looked at because it will still remain even if, and it hasn't even happened yet, right? China's still there. It's recently invading into Indian territory. It's putting almost an embargo of ships around Taiwan, we've got issues. It has invaded Hong Kong and is about to step that up as we speak if something doesn't radically happen. So we haven't even got rid of the communism and threat in the world yet. 21st century making great progress, right? But the thing is that even if we did, you know, that's what we're gonna explore right now. Even if we did, that crumble, that falls away, that melts away, guess what? The lollipop isn't finished yet because the inner core of it is still there. And that's what we know as socialism capitalized, right? And so that's why your average, and then the other, the other tack this takes is that what I've just said there is absolutely known to your guardian reader type of socialist who re is repugnant, right? He repels and recoils at the term communism, right? Most of the socialists that run the world and are in governorships now, right? All these fruitcakes in the media, on Twitter, right, on the streets, your governors and many even of uh, of the police or whatever these socialistic mindedly minded ones, they would re they would recoil the moment that you engage them and call them communists. So this is what we want to look at. I think a lot of people have heard that, but let's really explore the dynamic there. That means they're socialists. Is there really any difference at all between a socialist and a communist? And I don't think there is much, right? Uh, that's that's what my research has brought me to realize. And you see, although the Fabian movement, Fabian socialism, which is very, very active in the world, it's behind a lot what's going on right now, did come, you know, 30, 40 years later than the Communist Manifesto, right? But that is can also be uh, distracting us. That can be illusionary when you look at the, the physical dates because the underlying international, the revolutionary international preceded both. And goes back to 1790, you know, the French Revolution. And if you read the right stuff, like, you know, uh, Billington, it goes back even before that, the ideology. The ideology. It goes, this thing goes back to Kropotkin. This thing goes back to Proudhon, it ha, you know, to Blanco. It has many different um, permutations before it gets to, you know, the Dantons and the Robespierres and the French Revolution. It's already there prior to that. And it was definitely there in the 1800s, moving up to the modern era. You know, and then, of course, we know, don't have to say it again, it, it, one of its great manifestations was the Bolshevik Revolution. But if anybody thinks it stopped with the Bolshevik, or started or stopped with the Bolshevik Revolution, then, of course, they know very little about history. This incendiary revolutionary movement was at least, you know, uh, was, was at least 100 and probably even more than that. 
And that's why your Bismarcks and other great leaders of the time were worried. And each of those great leaders, you know, going back to the 1700s in France, in Britain, in, you know, Russia and in Germany and, and in Austro-Hungary, all had their own particular way of dealing with it. So an easy way into understanding European history is taking these individual people, especially if you're starting sort of 1750. And this includes even, you know, the story of Ireland, the United Irishmen, a lot of political parties coming out of Ireland that were revolutionary, young Italy, the young Turk movement, the pan-Arabic movement, the pan-Turkic movement, right? All of these movements are red or pink, or what we call socialist. So communist manifesto be damned. <laughs> Bolshevism be damned. That's one manifestation of a sleeping Leviathan that has its claws deeply in many nations. And we have to remember this when we're looking at headlines and we see these Pelosi's and all of these other lunatics out there to realize that your Bushes, even your Clintons, they all have one thing in common. And that's where we're going to point that today. They're Fabian socialists. And we'll only be able to touch on one of their beliefs at the time we have. You know, there's, they have many beliefs. And one of the beliefs, David, is, uh, and you know this, that if and when, well, let's put it this way. Uh, many of them, if you were to talk to one of these college professors, they're ones that mostly are these Fabian socialists, but they fill the think tanks, they fill the press. If you got them tipsy a bit at a party and, and sort of push them about their communistic beliefs, Basically, what they'll all concede, and I grew up amongst these people, so I've heard it time and time again, is that if you read Marx, the man said that the kind of communism we have, you know, the Stalin one that butchered millions, but that's not the real thing I support. It's called moving the goalpost. Yes, you've guessed, folks. But nevertheless, they will say, oh, sure, the communism that we've had all throughout the world that butchered millions and put Solzhenitsyn in the gulag and, and butchered it in genocidal. And, and the stats are there, you see, so you got to understand, you know, the black book of communism, they can't doubt. How can they doubt the legacy of the archipelago, the Gugelag archipelago, where, you know, uh, people like Solzhenitsyn are fully aware of how many died, right down to the numbers. And many other, you know, thinkers and scholars, we could say. So pushed that you're a red, you're a fucking red, right? They don't want to hear that. So they have, they have regrouped on the island of Fabian socialism, right? And this is the way that they appease their own consciences. Now, that was what the, the previous old guard said, you know, who grew up in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and on. The new millennium is exactly the same. A Pelosi, right? And some of these other governors that you're getting, and many people in the media, even if they're only millennials or 20, 30-somethings, which a lot of them are now, they have dug up that same excuse mechanism. I could, don't you call me a communist? Because they know that word's ugly and they know it. And also, you know, they professionally have understood. And also there's been thinkers out there, don't forget, who've actually, uh, I'll think of the names, you know, but but there's been thinkers out there who've even warned their people, the communists, don't use that word. Right? They've, they've actually insisted upon it. So we get the word globalist. So we get the word communitarian. There's an ugly word for you. Maybe you can look that up, David. Communitarian on Wikipedia. Just in case, again, this is new to people. Study that word. Study what that is. So these people have hid behind words like liberal, hid behind words like globalist, hidden behind words like hum humanist. It doesn't mean that they're those things haven't got legitimacy, by the way. This is another thing. You, If you start studying it, you'll find a lot of people you agree with in the liberal or libertarian movement or, you know, whatever it may be. But don't be fooled by that. This international has many has has developed many uh, hats to wear and many different uh, holes to hide in, right? So this is the kind of thing that they're up to. So back to what they believe. Is that it? Yeah. Whoa, that's tiny. Yeah, but anyway, people can go and look it up for themselves. Communitarianism. You start getting into the names there, the Etzois, the Walthers, and read up on it. Very important because this is the neo-Marxism. You know, we've, we've talked about Harbert, Marcuse, and others. We're not going to go into it all again. But this one certainly will put you on the right tracks because it's very, very active. So the communitarian and everything he believes is the Fabian socialist. Uh, uh, and we'll get to the amazing quote that uh, I sent that, again, we should comment on. But just to finish off, what is their belief? You haven't told us what the belief is. Well, they will always, they will always uh, retreat to the safety of, of this premise and this is all of them so again we have to know the enemy's thinking in order to have any hope of, of, of countermanding it right and their thinking is this Marx said or Engels whoever 
that capitalism it cannot be opposed in its own time. So all you stupid commies got it wrong, or all you you know Russian Marxists and Chinese Marxists got it wrong. Can't you read? The man said that these are historical epochal structures that that uh, when they fall away, they're replaced by the next thing. You know, historically, in in a teleological progressive way. So you cannot fight capitalism while it is dominant. You wait for it to perish. You wait for it to crumble under its own weight. And by the way, we said we wouldn't analyze it further. But as a matter of fact, they not only use this as a, uh, you know, uh, an adage, they not only have that as an ideology, they have many, many uh, things that they could cite that to them proves that that is happening. Now, now that's where we're not going to go, right? It just takes too long. But they can bullet 5, 10, 12 points that they look for, and then in their clubs, and in their think tanks, and in their dissertations, and they want their kids to know about these. And they go, analyze this. You'll get your PhD from us if you analyze this. And a lot of it has to do with electronica, by the way. Capitalism moving into the digital kingdom is one of the things they cite as being that it's a sign of capitalism crumbling under, under its own weight. But what we want to focus on, again, is that it, they believe it will. So hopefully that will help people who've been following our you know, conversations in which maybe that hasn't sunk in yet that the incendiary forces that run the streets looking down with capitalism, they're actually breaching even the true core Marx, uh, Fabian Marxist ideology, which is no such thing that was ever written by Marx and no such thing was ever advocated by Marx. It's just important detail, make of it what you want, right? But it is sound, it's solid. And, and many, many, many of these Fabian socialists, if not all of them, believe this. So you've got to know walking in what some one of their ideologies are. And you've also got to know that what's what's passing for revolution in the streets today is certainly under no circumstances what the Fabian socialist advocates. So maybe that helps us with our perspective. It is what a Balchi type of one would uh, would advocate and various other anarchistic Marxian groups like Antifa, right? Or, uh, or Ismail version of communism. I'm not saying that it's so off the charts. No, no, there are communistic groups that would go for what we're doing. But the next point then of this conversation is this. The mainstream Fabian socialists who really run the world are done with it. So all the events that you see in the world now, let's go to this perspective. Doesn't mean I got a gun to your head to believe this. We're, what we do here, right, is move things around. Okay, the shit that you see happening, the total rampaging, all of the rioting, their luna, luna, lunacy, you know, their lunacy, is because the Fabian socialist who really has the puppet strings of the global economy and the world is done, 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 stick a fork in me, done with communism. Interesting. Yeah. And the commies on the hard side go, know this, knowing this, have lost their wits, right? This does, has not gone down well. The memo came down. And they're going, oh, after all our work, you bastards, right? So what you're seeing is a revolution, a meltdown from within, right? And and this is why, and the way to prove it is that none of the rioting in the streets has the slightest thing to do with the original tenets of Marxism. And even if it once did, because I just cited a whole ages of revolution, it stopped being one when the smart commie, right, smartphones, no, 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 you didn't know about smart communism. The smart communism long abandoned it. The ones with the suit and ties, you know. Just like in Ireland, where they said, ah, oh, the guys with the denim jackets putting the bombs under cars, well, we'll let them hang on for a while. You know, they might even wipe themselves out. Think I'm being facetious? The thing was done and dusted, and they let the bombs, they let the hardcore within the uh, paramilitary murder each other. Huh, my size of relief cigars all around. Because the new paradigm, the Jesuitical one of bring Jerry and all to the table, love that, mahogany tables, tweed suits, camera eye, right? Bring those, oh, I'll have the queen shake Jerry Adams' hands, mass murderers. That's what we want now, same thing. And while Adams and McGinnis were lighting their cigars and the IRA quickly hid their arms, they let the lower rank and file butcher each other. It lasted about five years. I actually saw one of the murders in the street, right in the streets of Belfast, so, and it was in the papers, right? They've just cut and pasted that over to the situation. That the, They say, you guys can run ragged now, 
We've dropped you. There's no more financing. You're done. Whatever kind of uh, service you did, maybe, you know, we needed you for, it. that's long over, mate. So we pulled the plug on you. And this running in the streets is the feral action of basically the gangland level of the great international. So it does not change what we've said before, but it puts it into a different context of the inbuilt meltdown, right? The internal one, uh, you know, within 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 the entire communist international. They've just uh, jettisoned the tanks that they you know needed to get them into orbit. Is this is this similar to what actually did have it happen in the Soviet Union and many other places? Like this happened under Pol Pot, um, the Khmer Rouge, where basically they recruited a lot of these people on the lower level with Marxism, with the communistic ideals, and then once they established their new power structure, they killed all the people that helped them actually bring about the whole revolution to begin with. So it's like, oh yeah, come work for us, yeah yeah, and they know how to call you. And because they know what appeals to you on the lower level and they go, okay, come work for us. We're, we're going to start a revolution. We're going to change the world. And then once those guys go and do their things, they're like, Hey, feed me master. They're like, bullet in the back of the head. Thanks for your service. Moving on. Everywhere they did it. It's a tear effect. God knows where it first came out, but look up the word. See if it's in Wikipedia, the strawberry revolution. Excuse me. The Strawberry Revolution by Kunin. Uh, see what if it comes up. Get the author's first name on that. Something, you know, these links for people should look up to follow what we're talking about. And there's many other books. I've mentioned them all through my other podcasts of you know, 10, 20 years ago. But this has just jumped to mind from what your question has just uttered there. Did it come up, anything? Yeah, I'm just trying to find the right, the right up here. Yeah, maybe in Google or something. But the Strawberry Revolution was written by ex-Black Panthers who discovered exactly what you're talking about. Oh, is this the Strawberry Statement? I think, oh, that's just a film about yes, it. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, the Strawberry Statement. Good man, that's it. Yeah, I'll bring that up. It's a book also one can get, you know, a uh, little paperback. Vitally important book to get hold of, right? Uh, although I've put the I've put the greatest quotes from those books in my presentations for years, and this is the members of the Black Panthers. Not only he, but others as well. Uh, is that it? Boy, that's so tiny. Yeah, yeah. Strawberry Does it say the is a nineteen seventies American drama film about the countercultural culture and student revolts of the nineteen sixties, loosely mm -hmm. based on the nonfiction book by James Simon Coonan who has That's a cameo it. appearance in the film of the Columbia University oh. protests of 1968. So that's it. That's it. And that's another little piece that we're talking about here that people need to fit in. And there's even better books to recommend. But again, these are from men on the streets because everything we're seeing today has already happened. If we could just get that one point across to everyone listening, nothing is new. It's all a replay. But getting back to our point, the, the maniacs running in the streets today are the lowest level of the hive. Is it? It's pretty low, by the way, if you haven't noticed. I put up a thing on, you know, Gandhi. Uh, I don't. I'm not a Gandhi fan or anything like that. I don't. I'm not a. I'm not into revolutions. But um, probably the greatest authentic revolutionary was Gandhi, because he he got the British out of India. That was his mandate, right? And that's what he did. But the way he did it is very instrumental in the teachings of revolutionaries. Because right? they've got their own manifestos, you know, they've got their own mandates. But why, why, why is the most successful revolution never parodied, never repeated? That's very funny, isn't it? And Gandhi did get the English out of Britain in 1948, right? or 1945, whatever it was, the, the, the moment when uh, Lord Mountbatten Right, brought down the flag and India got its independence. Well, what was Gandhi doing that everybody else failed? Right? But I'll tell you one thing he did, and that is he made a declaration to the world. And it was taken seriously by many people, many Irish revolutionaries, you know, like James Connolly and others, uh, and others, others more literary figures, did take it very, very seriously. So it's not that it wasn't taken seriously. But the edict was you cannot revolt against an oppressor, right, with one hand and say, I am against thee and take anything from them with the other. 
tiny bit oversight there, right? So you can't have your Starbucks so, latte and go on Twitter with your iPhone and talk about uh, how we need to destroy capitalism, right? Is that what you're saying? Contradiction? No, no. And that's, that's, I'm not making this up. That's verbal. That is a verbatim. Why do you think the man wore that preposterous dhoti? One piece of, you know, cloth. He wove it himself. What we're talking about has the most ultimate historical significance for world revolution. So anyone who's even the, the senior people of government know this or should know this. This is, this is not anecdotal. This is huge because of the man's reputation, right? His manner of gaining freedom for his people and all the rest of it. All that revolutionary action was done in a certain way. He said, and there was a great march to the sea in which you can actually see vintage footage of this, of Gandhi going to the sea, picking up a handful of salt. And, and, and millions there, right? And he, he, he they, had, they shoved the microphone in his face and he said some words. And he basically said, from now on, we do not wear any of the clothing that is made in Birmingham or, you know, uh, all of the trade routes, you know, from Sheffield or whatever. We weave our own clothes. And this is Indian salt that we use in our cooking now. We will not use the British East India Company structure, you know, for spices and other. And basically, that's it. So this great world revolutioner who actually succeeded, therefore, he's the general, but nobody's copying it, laid down every single thing that, the, that his enemy had created or owned. And he started from absolute scratch. So the point being that the types that you see running right now are not in any sense true revolutionaries. They are destroyers, even ideologically. Their ideology is worthless when you embody the things that I'm talking about. They are the rabble, they are the rioters, and even Marxism long ago quit doing things like that, right? The Bader, Meinhof and all, you know, that didn't work. They all ended up in life prisons and committed suicide in jail. That's how brilliant they were. All these hard reds, you know, trying to do it through violence. It didn't work because you'd be crushed. And then the other reason why it failed is because the real international that ex chose to express itself through the Fabian model, do you have that link uh, of the Fabian, just in case that's brand new to somebody? They need to study that one. The Fabian socialist, what an incredible uh, you know, study this is of Fabian socialism. They're the ones who really gained the power of the world. They're the ones behind the real you know, red scare today, the world socialism. This group here decided to lay down those arms. They never really did. They never, ever, ever chose that method and were highly scathing of it even at the time that they came to bear in Cambridge University right, and all of this. This was a university-created uh, group. The, even their emblem shows you a wolf in sheep's clothing. And other emblems also show you the slow, gradual process. The very name Fabian comes from the emperor, or the, uh, sorry, sorry, it was the general Fabian, who in fighting Hannibal decided to do it through a, what's called a war of attrition. Extremely slow, patient actions. In other words, Marcuse's march, long march through the institutions, or whoever the, it was genteel, right? Or whoever was the... Uh, I remember right now who was a thinker who came up with that term, long march through the institutions, right? Uh, it'll come to me in a minute, but that's what it is. So the Fabian society always turned their nose up at violent revolution and cited, you know, we're not going to go into it. They cited the reasons that they didn't think it was necessary. Well, we have cited one of the reasons. And that reason is as pertinent today as it was in 18, whatever it was there that they formed the Fabian Society, and that is ca capitalism will crumble under its own weight, folks. And they only promote school teachers, college professors, university deans, think tank heads, press editors, everyone by and large, they're not communists. You do have some still around the hardcore. Well, you have China, right? Of course they're still around. But by and large, the people that have infiltrated America, that's the crux. Because there, isn't, there, isn't there a running question right now uh, uh, about where did all these guys come from? Every time I look in the media, there's some other ponce jumping up from within the, this service or that service or this Congress. Right? How did all these communists get in the power? Well, this is the way they did it. Because they were socialists who got promoted because they believed this model that we're talking about. The model that is, you can't fight capitalism while it is going. It will always win. Because the real secret of dialectical materialism or any of the, the nonsense that Marx came up with is all based in a teleological unfolding in which the systems decay. It's vaguely 
Hegelian, because they were left Hegelians. So my God, don't blame Hegel for any of this, right? But it was left Hegelians of Germany who came up with this twist on it. That wait for the thing to crumble. Well, then to finish off, you know, any my last comments on this, obviously that end date must be in sight to the socialist Fabian. The Fabian socialists must be able to see. Now you could, like I said, if you read them, if you know their if you know their thinking, you can actually be ahead of them. You can read what they're doing. You can look over their shoulders to look at the charts. Because to fold up the old communism to the extent that they're doing means that they must have now within their sights as clear as day that goal that capitalism is of itself the destroying maybe the 2008 fiasco you know and the bailouts we could talk endlessly about things that have happened you know in real time that might vindicate that the whole bush administration but you know whatever let's not get into that the fact is that these people now have it on their radar and so that goes communism we allowed you in the room you, we've always felt that you're a bit of an elephant but for old time's sake we gave you a break see now now that that blip you're done and they're ranting and raving and weeping and crying and banging the spoon is what you're getting in america now so again people digest this think what it means for you think what it means in terms of how long this chaos will last you know or is it just histrionics as, as, as the Tsarin is saying you know, maybe it'll go away and we'll all get back to some sort of normality. I don't know. I'll leave you all to think about that. But this is factual what I'm talking about. This is the meltdown within. And that the Fabian socialist could not, doesn't want to see those those grimy hands serving him as soup anymore. You are fired. And the other side is running around, said, well, I'll pull up all your plants then. I'm going to smash your fucking windows. I served you. And now you're just paying us all off, right? I'm going to throw some shit on your windows, right? And, and that's it. That's the final purge. And even if these Boogaloo people are finally nailed in whatever way it might happen in the following weeks, it doesn't really bother me because the real story of the socialism still exists. And that's why it's deeply in the hearts of these people who are in very high positions of power. So obviously we have to wait for this, uh, all, like, like we did in Ireland. We waited for the explosions to die down so we could get to the real culprit, the Jesuits. In this situation, you have to let the histrionics boil down right, and fade away and the cacophony can die down before we go, okay, can we get back to the table now with the real problem? So, you know, let, let, let that be uh, digested, I suppose. Oh, and Trump. I don't think Trump is co-opting any of this, right? But he may know about it. It's just last thing I'll say, is that he may be also taking a back seat to say he knows a lot of this, and therefore he's not he's not supporting the rise of socialism and the of communism. But he knows that this is an inevitable tactic. You know, there he's seen through through who, through his informants that this is bound to happen. So the less you have to actually do directly with it, let it let it work itself out, and then we'll deal with it after the chaos because you can't get in and micromanage chaos. So hold back a bit, you know. So by no means do I think he's part of this. By no means do I think he's sitting there with all those Fabian socialists going, this is just wonderful, I'll wait till it's all over because I'm advocating for the new socialism to come in. I don't think that. I really don't, right? And we'll, we'll know for sure in his posture towards Hong Kong and China and all of that. But already what he's been doing, I don't think he's any Fabian socialist. I think he's trying to save the old paleo-conservatism, what I think. But, you know, okay, that, that's only 70, 60, 70% proven. You know, but it's good enough to go on. No, the real problem is the ones who want to overthrow Trump and bring in the very Fabian socialism, the most deadly smart communism. Think of that. Since the 1990s and the fall of the Berlin Wall, that threat has been waning. And then we have we do have hybrids of it, but the real modern threat is Fabian socialism. So just wanted to do a little talk with you on that, you know, to just emphasize that in case that's a piece that's been missing from a lot of people who've been listening. Oh, it's brilliant. It's crucial. And the only thing I would add to it is one of the ways I look at this is I've been trying to follow what is being proposed by the people that have the reins, you know, like if you go to a website right now, it's called the World Economic Forum, and you go and look at their whole dissertation on something that they are terming the Great Reset. And it's always fun to get in and see who finances this and who is behind it. Um, George Soros and many others, Bill Gates and all these other people we've talked about before. But um, when you actually hear what they're proposing, they've come up with a new term, Michael. Klaus, whatever his name at the World Economic Forum, is now calling this stakeholder capitalism. Now, when he mentioned that, and then I listened to him go and ramble on about what the solutions are going to be, 
the Great Reset, the World Economic Forum are working in tandem with something called Agenda 2030, which is run by the UN, and it is loaded with these Fabian Socialist ideologies. So if you read Fabian Socialism, we're going to read a quote in a minute. You study exactly the history you're talking about, about this more overt type of militant, in-the-streets, revolutionary communism. They realize that that's not effective, as you said, but I don't personally believe they're waiting for capitalism to fall on its own weight because capitalism wouldn't fall on its own weight. They are actually trying to cause that to fall on its own weight by using the term capitalism as a guise, wolf in sheep's clothing. People think capitalism's, I mean, capitalism's just free enterprise, guys. Relax, right? But the way they do it is it's crony capitalism. And when you hear what they're saying, they're talking about literally pulling all the resource control, micromanaging every square inch of this planet and every cell in your body, monitoring it and having it centralized in a totalitarian type situation that they're going to run with what they're calling stakeholder capitalism. When you go and read Carol Quigley and you see what he said, what he was told by these committees of 300 or whatever that the model was going to be, they were looking at creating a hybrid between communism and what he called super capitalism which we know in conservative circles is just crony bullshit capitalism that's nothing but rigged monopoly games. So when you put all those terms together and then take in what you've been talking about, and then you also take in how many of these people that I've interviewed on my show, we've had some of them on Slave, that have said that after the communism was seen to be a complete and total utter failure and it should be erased from the memory of every human being, they went to social communism, cultural Marxism. They can't win in the economic field because it's complete bollocks, but they can win in the minds of the young and they can, that's how they do it. So it's been a slow process of them actually changing from, it's just changing strategies. If this is big global grand chessboard, like Zygmunt Brzezinski said, they're playing chess and they're going, okay, people have really started to awaken to the fact that this particular ideology wipes out millions and just causes nothing but poverty and equality and misery. So we have to try to sell them on a new brand of totalitarianism. And that's the Fabian technique of, well, we're still about brotherhood of man. We know that that economic system won't work. So we're going to build that into this new capitalism structure. We're going to call stakeholder capitalism or super capitalism, which isn't capitalism. It shouldn't even be associated with it. And we're going to concentrate the power of the many into the hands of the few. So it's like, it's the same game. They just put new names on it. They update it just like our phones get updated. And then they're going to do it with robots and AI and quantum dots and all that other shit too. So that I would recommend go like, so this world economic forum is featuring, um, the UN chief Antonio Gutierrez, who was formerly, and I think he's still involved with something called the socialist international. And when you look at that organization and you see how it feeds into the UN and that whole agenda, and then you talk, bring in what you're bring, talking about, we're just seeing a smarter, more deadly, more subtle, all this Huxley style socialism. That is what they want to bring in. That's just the way I see it. Hey, I'm so glad you brought this up because it's very true. What I was explaining there was the ideology, right? That is, uh, that has motivated uh, socialists from the 1800s onwards. You're honing in much more to the canvas. How much do you want to bet that when and if this neo, you know, communistic system was was in place, 70% of it would be hybridized capitalism of exactly the kind we've always known. They know that too. Some of the top people within the steering committee of what we're talking about, maybe George Soros and above and uh, many others, especially the ones involved more in the economics, you know, they they consider themselves radical leftists. And they're on the on the uh, they're on the economics side. They know this actually, and they play with words all the time. This super capitalism, communism that you're talking about, and stakeholder capitalism. They also they also try the word play with the words patriot and nationalist. Right, uh, you know uh, they they're doing this, and what has shown me is exactly what you've said that even if. They got in place their version that was meant to replace capitalism in the timeline. No. On scrutiny, we'd find that about 60%, if not more, is just tweaked, hybridized capitalism of the old kind, slightly spring cleaned in their so-called ultra-communism. Because you're right, the whole thing is bankrupt economically. Always has been, right? Mises Institute 
or anyone else will tell you this, right? And every time it's been attempted to be implemented, especially in China, for goodness sake, the, the highest intellects who are free journalists in China, Chinese people, by the way, will, will completely confirm that every edict of the Chinese government for the last 50 years has failed, socially and economically. And they even have quotes from inside government that the, the, inside the Chinese government that conceded this, okay? So even its last implementations, and then when you compare it side by side with the capitalist model, you know, like say Hong Kong or Taiwan, my God, any fool can see what we've talked about. And the ideology is bankrupt as well. When I sketched it out there, I didn't think it was going to ever succeed. Of course, it'll change. It'll have to, right? There's no metal in it. So quietly, when you're not looking, they're going to you know, insert some lead, hopefully the backbone into the puppet, into the homunculus. We'll, we'll give it, you know, you know, they'll try to do a makeover to make it look vaguely human. No, none of it's going to work. Uh, and in fact, if you even turn to the psychological perspective, all you have to do is look and study the, uh, the uh, advocates of it from a psychological point of view, right? And I mean, even physiologically, by the way, Nancy Pelosi types, right? To know it ain't gonna work because look who believes it. Look what types, but we're not gonna get into that unpopular subject, but it's a fact. Yeah, George Soros, mm-hmm, yeah, Bill Gates. Oh yeah, fucking hell. Right, what's that when it's at home, right? That's uncatalogable. They don't even have a species catalog for that. It's certainly not human. So, I mean, you couldn't pin that to a board. And then I want to, you know, listen to it. Imagine it has some political power. But the thing is, you have to cite what we've been citing, right? And and by all means, uh, see, when you think of America, oh, by the way, there's a retrospective, you know, over since uh, before Brexit, going back maybe mm, five, ten years, certainly since the invasions, right? Oh, six or whatever. Uh, 16, sorry, 15, 16. Merkel, her crowd, they're the Fabian socialists. They're not Marxists. You can show all the marching, pictures of her marching in the old days with whatever. Look, you know, it's changed. They're left. Now, socialism is predicated upon feminism. There's another one for you, an equation that's real popular, right? But the kid gloves are off. So the thing is that socialism in all of its manifestations, even the Balchi type, you know, that appeared to be really belligerent and incendiary, all of it, right from the first, from its first manifestations onwards, it was psychotic people. Remember Carrie Bolton's Psychotic Left? We should definitely cite that book along with the UK column. All of the people, Rousseau, they're all crazy folks and they all have mother complexes and all the rest of it that we've gone into time and time again. But in short, Socialism is the equivalent typologically of feminism, right? And also feminization, right? We'll be doing more and more and more on this down the line. But the thing is then, what this means is that in the feminist model, and even if you meet it at the dawn of the Grecian society, you can go back almost uh, you know, to, the, to the founding of Greece and Rome. Uh, to Phrygia, you can go back as far as you want. And what I'm going to say now holds. So there's history behind this. And that is the feminized urbanite, the feminized policy or politic or polity is always borderless, is always colorless, right? Is always non-hierarchical and all-encompassing. That's part of its psychosis. All children come from my womb. So I don't care if you're brown, black, orange, pink, or whatever. So the communitarianism is, and the communism and the socialism is based on a feminized idea of the world. Uh, uh, and if people find that hard to understand, we'll use the contrary terminology, anti-masculine. Not anti-male, don't go down there. That's not quite, that'll not lead you truly. Anti-masculine as a typology. Un Anti-heroic, right? Anti-progressive, even though they've co-opted that word just like they're co-opting patriotism, but trying to tell you they're not nationalists. I'll leave you to work that one out, right? But they're stealing <laughs> a lot of words from us. But getting back to the thread, right? All children on this planet come from my great teeming womb, says this archetypal goddess. If you're in veneration of that form, force, <laughs> sorry about the psychology, folks, but, you know, that's, that's my expertise, right? Have to go there. And that's why you can, Merkel can say, 
but I don't notice that they're from Syria or they're Muslim or they're criminals or they're black or they're white or anything like that. Down with all of that. These are good, healthy workers. We need them in our society, folks. So along with the idea that capitalism will fall, if you're really scrutinizing, you'll know they mean more than just capitalism falling on its own petard. They mean Western civilization falling on its own petard. Don't miss that footnote. And so in their feminized minds, there are no countries, David. There's no China. There's no Syria. There's no Saudi Arabia. There's no Israel. There's no Palestine. There's no Spain and Portugal and all that. That's old thinking. That's that old male and pale. Ew, ew, ew. And do you think anybody today coming out of any college in the whole of America doesn't agree with that? There's nothing but, because they've been taught nothing but by the teachers at the front of their class who haven't taught them communism. That's, that's only partly true. They've taught them a Fabian socialism coming out of some very interesting names, which we won't pause here to talk about, these anthropologists and sociologists. They've taught that. And embedded in that is this egalitarian, ecumenical, globalistic model. The Swedes bought down on it years and years ago, centuries ago, long, and, and many other cultures have as well. But the whole of Scandinavia has been poisoned by this long, long, long time. And I haven't even thought it out. They don't even know the opposition. They're not equal. True equality has never been in Sweden and countries like that. And it's not even in their thinking to go and find out what the opposite is of the edicts that they hold. That's a country that is completely lost from a cultural point of view. And if we're not careful, we'll, we'll be in the same hole. So this feminization yeah, equals too. the invasion. Yeah, it's, it equals the invasion you saw in 15 and 16. All of that being allowed into the West is all, and, and then saying they're needed for jobs, or whatever the rhetoric then you know, follows suit uh, on the individual level is first couldn't even, why did they do it? Why do they allow it, right? All these European countries, people ask. Because they're Fabian socialists and their psychology is feminized. So just add that a key psychological aspect. And that is the feminized mind sees all people colorlessly. And it's fake. It's totally, because the people you're bringing in don't have that same mentality. They're not Fabian socialists. That's where the whole thing's going to go wrong. We just said a few minutes ago it's bankrupt. Here's the perfect proof. Because everyone that you think that you're bringing in based on your own edict and your own ideology, don't share that ideology. Welcome to the club of the self-imploding circus act. There's never there's never been a punch and duty show like this one. It's incredible. It's incredible. Um should we go Soros, to this quote? Trudeau, Merkel, yeah, Trudeau, Merkel, all of them have this. They're all feminized. But yes, please, please, please go to the quote. So here we go. This was the one that you sent me. This is just on the Fabian Society. I believe this is their mandate. Is that correct? So yeah. this is, is there, the it's idea. It's their motto. It's their motto. So their motto is, and let's see if we see if there's any similarities here. The Fabian model is to promote greater equality of power, wealth and opportunity, the value of collective action and public service, an accountable, tolerant, and active democracy, citizenship, liberty, and human rights, sustainable development, <clears throat> and multilateral international cooperation. Got to decode that one. That's Satan. That's Satan's own. That's that's a tattoo right off Satan's butt. Yeah. <laughs> so the thing is, first of all, there's no even word of patriotism or nationalism in there. The very things that hold civilizations together and that make a mitwelt. So remember, I've always said, if you ever want to gain enlightenment, there's a simple way. You know, the quick Tessarian uh, A to Z guide. Pay attention to what people don't say as much as what they do. You just find yourself uh, in a different place in your life. Go back to that. Can we see it? Collectivism is the number one. I mean, let's, you don't even have to read the whole thing. Just look at the first line. They're number one. Oh, well, actually, no, technically speaking, equality of power. But they're disseminating it. You see how the term, the term this, is a legal, this is a legal motto. They're not asking for it to, to be developed. They're going to promote it because they know already what it is. It's very cunning, but it's like we know what equality is, and we're going to shove it down your face, right? That is what that word means, to promote because we already have it and we already know what it is. So there's dictatorship, there's dictatorship of the Hitlerian form right there. They already assume that they are the philosopher kings who know what equality is. Nobody knows what equality is. Nobody could ever know about it. 
because it's a moral statement. And when you try to politicize that word, or when you try to make it a act of economics or any other thing, you're talking in absolutely infantile terminology. There's only one context that the word equality means anything, and that is in moral terms. So the very fact that that word has been co-opted by sociologists and by econo economists and by these plonkers that you know in the government positions is already a lie. Go, go back again. Equality of power. You know what that is? Equality of power is what you got in the streets of of uh, Seattle right now. They're showing how they manipulate power. You just Chaz. Do don't those, they have like, borders too? Yeah. And by the way, they'll have worse. They'll be exactly what Blake said when you say to crush the tyrant's head, become a tyrant in his stead. Then it says wealth and opportunity, which you work towards heroically and get. You do, you're never bestowed that. So that's another lie. The value of collective. Well, here we go. There's that we, us, and our creeping in. Didn't take very long, did it, folks? So this is the word that is the death knell of all civilization right there. Particularly psychologically, but in other modes as well. Even on the most physical, practical form, collectivism, as Ayn Rand and Nathaniel Brandon and the greatest teachers in our world, and Sterner, Max Sterner and others have said, is the sole word you don't want in the lexicon of a civilization. You can't have a Solzhenitsyn. You can't have a Beethoven. You can't have a Mozart with that word in your brain. There's no change at all in any corner of life where there's a we, an us, or an our. Public service, an accountable, tolerant, and active democratic citizenship. <coughs> Don't even know what that means. Liberty. Oh, liberty is interesting too because liberty is what you're given on a ship and it's purely temporary. Under no circumstances should the word liberty be mistaken for freedom. Now come back for a minute. Just to expand upon that, if somebody's not knowing, under under uh, maritime law, liberty is what's given to the sailors when they go abroad to whore and spend their money and drink that rum, like Popeye, the sailor man. They're given temporary liberty, but we expect you back here, buddy, to get back to the oars, you know, like the old galley. And the other thing is as well, uh, is that the opposite of liberty is freedom, right? They're not connected, they're actually opposites. Because the kind of freedom we're going to talk about this on Sunday with chance, but the kind of freedom uh, that would be patriotic people would say, I don't like this liberty concept. I know it's has on, it's only value in a maritime situation. I don't like the legalese behind that, but you know, I'm free. Well, you know, that's, that's not, that's not a salvation. Like many patriots, well-meaning patriots believe we'll talk about that on Sunday. Go back to the quote, please. One more time. Just to throw that in. But yeah, you have liberty. You have a chain around your neck and a long arm, and they'll give you a long rope to go on whore and party and then get right back to work, right? Human rights, what a laugh that is. You'll have human rights when you honor the rights of nature and animals. How about that one for size? Sustainable development. That means living in a Russian-style gulag. And a multi, oh, here we go. Oh, oh, I love this one. Multilateral, mm -hmm. meaning collectivized international cooperation. Well, there's communism. So, like I said, the socialism is communism. There's the last line proving it. The communitarianism and Fabian socialism is a form of communism, but it's the original type that was invented by the real international, you know, in the 1700s, before you even get to a French Revolution iteration or the or these groups that I talked about, you know, uh, Young Italy, Young Ireland. Before you get to your pan-Turkic movement and pan-Arab movement, look that up, and all the rest of it. So... In the Merkel's mind, in the Trudeau mind, they're waiting for capitalism to fall. You said it won't fall. They're right. But they can convince. These are people who are psychotic. So it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. You, you get in life what you think is there. Right? When, you, when, you're, when you're blind and dumb, you know, uh, somebody will tell you that hanging spaghetti is an octopus and you'll believe it, right? So these people see in a mirage form the end of capitalism. You're quite right. And they will envision this world of borderless and how dare Trump the racist build a wall, right? So they will they will have this derangement because they have a vision of the end of capitalism and this you know new neo-communism model coming in, which they'll definitely give a lot of different names to, right? But they believe that it's coming in. They have the dream, AOC, Corbyn, Saunders, Merkel, Trudeau, right? All of these, Obama and Soros. 
They've got that on the mind. And of course, in each of their minds, they may take what we said about the fall of capitalism and they have their own. It's not like they're all reading from the same page, but they're reading from the same book. But each of them have a different you know, way to do it. Obviously, Sanders bowed out before this chaos because actually, you know, he doesn't believe in this, what's happening. Or he may have pulled out for other reasons. But I'm not fussed about their inner, you know, different uh, angles, uh, you know, while they're playing bridge. It's the fact that they're all playing the same game. And this, they've also, been, as children, been taught what we're talking about. This goes back a long way, as we've said. So all of them were tutored in the universities of America that had already been taken over by the Fabian Socialist Network, which is why when you had these McCarthy purges of communism, they were untouched. Communisms were taken down. Congress, congressional hearings were had. And a few top communists, you know, lost their positions and were exposed, you know, and even by the FBI and all. But none of these social, Fabian socialists were touched. And even the people who addressed that they existed are very few. They're my mentors, right? So all that really you can say is that the Fabian vision isn't quite the same as communism. Communism wanted to attack and destroy capitalism as it stood. The Fabian socialist said, you can't even read. That is absolutely not what you do, right? You just go about your business every day. You write those books. You climb up the ladder of the institutions. You take a long march through the institutions, but you keep your suit and tie and your briefcase and your car and your pocket spot while you're doing it. And they are the most dangerous ones of all. They're the ones that Solzhenitsyn did war warn about, that Wilhelm Reich and others warned about. The ones that are harder to see. The ones that will be so immersed in your capitalism that, as you said, they'll undermine it from below. Of course, it's not as passive as it, just letting it happen. There's, there's often a lot of activity to, you know, to contaminate it from within. Of course, that's true. But in the, what we now need to focus on is that factor in, folks, to your view of what's happening today, the post-capitalist world, even as an ideology or a reality. It's up to you. And then you think of how your enemy also has that in their vision. And then the histrionics that are happening today, you know, it'll give you like a, two ends of the spectrum. It'll give you two bookends, I hope, you know. And that this uh, smart communism, so when you see these insider smiles and all these Johnnies are jumping up against Trump today and telling you that they're with the revolutionaries and all of that, they have envisioned this post-capitalistic world. And you must have it too, because otherwise you're not part of the narrative. It explains the changes within socialism. It explains why G. Edward Griffin's masterworks always talk about power from two po points, power from above and power from below. The thing is that now the change is, the nuance is that the power from above doesn't need the power from below anymore. So it's a fallout within communism itself. It's not required. This job description is null and void. And then add to that, go back in your mind to the great invasions of Europe allowed by Merkel and others. Yes, because in their eyes, it's a feminized world that you see, which doesn't have color, doesn't have creed. It means nothing to them that you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Satanist. That's all old school. That's all dinosaur stuff. So what if the East invades the whole of the West and the West goes around to the East and upside down? They don't care. They don't even factor that in. If you're fighting that, you're a Nazi. Don't you know that? You're just a Nazi if you if you go against the, the implementing of the agenda. And you'll do very, very well in life on all levels if you subscribe to the agenda. That's why the people who have their jobs in you know, your economics and the politics today. And not, and more and more and more, there was a, uh, my, you, you, maybe David, you should even put this link. It's, uh, what's his name? Wolfenson from the World Bank, giving a lecture at one of the colleges in uh, America. And everything I'm talking about, you'll be able to crack that, that insider smile. And the way he's talking to those kids, he's saying exactly what I'm saying. He's talking about that a paleo capitalism is over. It's going to either fall on its own petard or it's going to be pushed over the edge in its last dying, heaving moments. And as I said, they have a whole bunch of bullet points that convince them and their audiences that this is going to happen. We are certainly not going to go into all of that now. What we have to ask is any of that program, you know, in our private life separately, we ask whether that program that they have, once you know that they have it, is sensible. Is it just more batshit from their minds? Is it just more psychosis? You know, is it just the product of some champagne socialists again and hipsters that are the, the, the ones getting the degrees from these modern collegiates, right? Uh, if Even if they do get their way, can they be countered? 
right? Now that we know who we're really targeting, right? Old communism gone, Fabian socialism in, right? How do we then arm up to combat that? Will they get their new world order or will they not? If the U.S. is literally infested, and I mean completely and utterly from the state to the federal level, with these people, what do we do then? Can it be saved? And what do we do if the answer is no? Uh, you know, so we've, we've got a whole list of questions we needn't bother with looking at in detail now. But we do have the general picture then of two paradigms, right? The old paradigm, as you've loved and your fathers knew, it's not perfect. It had lots of things to fix. But as we've already spoken in other programs, it's still so young. The age of reason was young and the age of Western civilization was young. We didn't get a chance to do anything before these incendiary fires took place. The very emergence of world revolution came about exactly at the time of the founding of America. So don't tell me that America had five freaking minutes to enjoy right, what it was creating without already being weakened right, by the donkeys kicking the lion to death. Right? So we, we, have, we should apologize for nothing, absolutely nothing. We didn't even have enough time to get off the ground to show us what capital, real capitalism can be you know, of the Mises type, of the Randian type. So we don't have to apologize to any of these people for any alleged, uh, you know, uh, faux pas of capitalism. In fact, just look at China and tell us which of the two. You want us to apologize? Their social experiment took down hundreds of millions of people. Demonstrably. And you're asking us for apologies? Absolutely out of order. Or even when it comes to this whole um, debate, now with the whole the, the inflammation of the race wars and all that which is interesting because we have these george soros's and these other foundations of these guys actually financing antifa black lives matter and all of these different groups that are out there rioting so there's something about that revolutionary action is still of value to them even if it's just to cause the chaos and the distractions so that the media can keep everybody asleep while they rearrange all the furniture. It could, it's got to be something like that. But there was a really good bit from Thomas Sowell where he was saying, why are they asking the West to apologize for slavery? The West ended slavery, number one, and lost a lot of people, time, money, and energy to do it. And um, why don't we talk about the Islamic slave trade? I mean, you want to talk about slaves coming over from Africa? who were gathered up by other fellow African-Americans to bring them over to the slave ships and sell them, their own people to these people. Um, and it was looked at as getting, winning the lottery to get a slave, sh get over to America, even though it's just horrible. What, nobody wants slavery, but just if you want to get into the, to the weeds of it, that was only 5% of the amount of slaves that went over to the, to the Islamic That's slave right. trade. So why aren't they on right. their it's knees begging for starter. forgiveness? No, we're inviting them in and going, oh, please shut up Sharia law courts all over the place and let's, let's put them in parliament for crying out loud. Well, the study of anybody in a negative context doesn't exist. In this liberal paradigm that I said is feminized, you don't talk about Arabia. You don't talk about the Turkish Ottoman Empire. You don't talk about you know, the Safavids or, or any of these other uh, East of Prague groups. You, you focus your critique entirely on the West. These Derrida's and these Marcuse's and Foucault's, that's what they've done. Uh, they never critique themselves. Calling themselves uh, critical Marxist or whatever, critical theory, is beyond a joke since they never criticize their own. And that should tell us what, who they are, what they're about. They're, they're not deconstructionists at all. They're destroyers, period. You know, and we must treat them as such. But remember, it's almost like there's, it's not the first time in history that you need to have the enemy at the gates in the truest sense before you, know, you wake up. We are the most generous people. We're the least racist people. We're the most under the attack. Everybody cares about only themselves. Even when they get here, they don't change their spots. There's no such thing as integration. Just because some of them are quiet doesn't mean that behind the scenes they don't support the terrorists in, in our midst. And they damn well do. That's the whole point. That can be proven as well. You know, so yeah, I mean, we're gonna have to fight everything that is worthwhile in life has to be fought for, right? But you fight better when you know the tactics of your enemy, and also better still, you know, their psychology. All the generals used to have the picture of the other general, the enemy general, on their desks or on their wall. Why, right? Because it's that kind of game. A lot of psychology, a lot of history is required because of history, it tells you what mistakes not to make again, doesn't it? In battle or war or even on the strategic level. So, 
the hopeful thing is that we are stronger because we we're not bat crazy like they are. We don't have as many psychotic people, right? Um, I, I've all, I've said from day one that I don't want anybody in who follows me to be thinking that you're going to get sound bites. I only am interested in people to look at my work who will spend the time to read, follow up. That's why I've always I've been the one in this movement who's had the most copious links, the most copious uh, citations, and the most copious uh, quotes. To back up form, almost meaning you're taking the time to take people through it, yeah. which is important, right? Because so many people just want we do that. I too. get people all the time. They're in the comment, Dave, you, your channel would grow more if you just did like 10 minute clips. I'm like, well, <laughs> I can't tell you the truth in 10 minutes. It's that bad. So it's going to no. take four hours. No, it can't Sorry. be done. I never try. Yeah, I've done some things that approach that. But in general, I've not done that. Uh, and, and another thing also is that people don't understand uh, passion and aggression. You get this constantly, you know, about being too aggressive and all the rest. Yeah, well, from a beta point, beta listener, a beta, beta boy or girl, yeah, of course, Tassarin's fucking over the top. But if you're an alpha man, you have no problem with me. So I know that. So up yours, those people who think that they can't tell the difference between passion and aggression. The oh, person man. who can't tell the difference between passion and aggression is already defining themselves as a beta or less. Absolutely. So, you know, be as offended by that as you want. I'm not interested in that. The world is burning and you're wondering whether Tassarian uh, is too aggressive in his manner. That's what your priorities are. You're a pillock if you think that way. And we, uh, we don't want you anywhere near this work. Please, by all means, take a powder. Don't come anywhere near my work ever again. You've got my complete and utter authority, you know, permission to do that. Stay the hell away. Oh, for sure. For Ridiculous. Sure. These are times where anyway, David. Yeah, I, I this is great, Michael. It's so good to do these updates and drop this for people to give the context because that's what we're missing. We're, it, again, because a lot of people unfortunately are still just listening to sound bites, even in this whole movement. I mean, we want to get the memes out there and do what we can to crack some of the. But I mean, when you're talking amongst ourselves, people who are educated, people who are committed to this. We've got to up the game and we got to stop the infighting and worrying about all the details and oh, who's like you get people come on here and they're worried. They're wondering about what kind of hat somebody's wearing and what's wrong with the, what kind of shirt they're wearing. Just, what are you doing? Focus on the real enemy, focus on the real information. Uh, what happened to our attention span? Our attention span is like that of a goldfish and we can't operate like that because the attention span of our enemy and the commitment and the detailed approach in which they bring about their operations. We're not even close. So it, it, we got to move the goal. We got to move the, the barometer here a little bit. And it's, it's very important that we talk about the actual facts and, and stop this, you know, pussyfooting around about it. The truth doesn't care about how we feel about any of it. It's not about nature doesn't, the truth is what the truth is. And we have to explore the truth. We've got to be brave enough to make mistakes. That was a great statement you made in your uh, presentation on architects of control. Um, we were like, we have to, we ha this is a new movement. We have to keep pushing, but look at what we've been able to accomplish in waking people up to these facts in such a short period of time, going uphill, pushing six boulders at once, being censored, being shut down, being lambasted, penniless, you know, all that, still been able to wake up millions. So that just shows you That's how right. powerful the truth is. And the truth doesn't even really need defending. It just needs some disseminating. Yeah. And watch for the envy of these Professor Blacks and others who, knowing exactly what you said, how we have achieved so much in such a concentrated form of time with modern technology, they're deeply envious of that because they haven't achieved that. You know, they have not achieved it. They're, they're not a fringe group. They're not an underground society. They're not individual maverick thinkers. None of those things apply to those people. It doesn't apply even to people like uh, Jordan Peterson as much as I love his work. So let's get things into perspectives. And some of those people, not Peterson himself, but other people like him from institutions are deeply envious of mavericks. They always have been and they always will be. You know, where it's not because we're blowing any trumpets we're just doing vocational work they're doing you know they're doing occupational work right their lives are occupational we are vocational and when you really know what that word means and then once you've done it long enough you understand why you get the muck sl you know, slung at you and why people as you said don't focus on the actual material uh, and pretend that they want sound bites and all and as i said even if you were to cart in truckloads of evidence see i don't do it because i've learned they don't change they don't change even with all evidence because they're not really interested in that. There's something else going on that's far more infernal 
in the psychology of the institutionalized organization. Man, we've spoken about it in Schopenhauer's era, and they absolutely despise the free thinker because of the you know the, the very roots of our civilization are poisoned already. We talked about that in recently in Cocteau's uh, in the show about Jean Cocteau, and we've talked about it even before that. You know, but that's a different conversation. But you're quite right. Be aware of why they come out with a heavy gear to try and take us down. Because remember, hasn't it been a threat all the way through this last year or so that they've come out in force against, really aggressively against the conspiracy the people? There's, they've even got, and Brian Garish actually cited a guy, I think his name is John Storm Stromer. He's, he's, one, of the, he's one of the top uh, marketing PR advertisers of today. You know, we've always talked about the old guard of the hidden persuaders. Well, hidden persuader number one is cited by Brian Garish on his latest, uh, you know, UK column. Please watch it. And this motherfucker is telling, he's making statements saying it is so important to have a PR that's totally invisible to the public. I won't go on. Just like we read from that Fabian script, this man is telling the world, he's telling the world marketers, when you sell your product, and he's not just talking about product, he was talking here in context of conspiracy people and anti-vax people. You're failing to, to, to woo them you're failing to get them on your side and they're staying within their muddy little conspiracy theory because you haven't sufficiently given them the juju. They're not under the hex. And when you make the hex, you know, come to, when you put the hex on them, you have to do it so it's so invisible that they just glide over to our world. You think I'm kidding? That is called a hidden persuader. And that's the kind that is in control of your fucking mind. And you're worried about whether to Sarian? is aggressive and what he's wearing around his neck or what the fuck are you? this is your priority the fucking juju is on you mate they're walking in plain light of day they're 20 30 somethings they're the hidden persuaders that your children are going to be sold to the devil over and you're wondering whether if he could tone down his irish accent it's not going to happen we're not I mean, we're not on the same wavelength never tone it down i love it Right. I'm worried about here. universal fucking evil, right? And if I see fear in your eyes or I look in your eyes, I'm meant to be a comrade in this movement and I see nothing but bullshit, you'll have me to fucking deal with, not the enemy. I'll eviscerate your fucking arse. You won't get into the starting line. It's just it's not going to happen. So wake up. I mean, there it is. There's the man. They're not even hiding it anymore. They're not even telling you Look, 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 let's get this real straight. Professor Black, you've got the microphone. Well, you guys all believe in Satanism and weird things like that, you know, and a conspiracy theory. The top PR guy in the world is telling you, right? I am Satan, and here's how I work. Mr. Black, meet Mr. Stromer. Count us out. You don't like it when we point, right? When we're in the, in the mix, you, you take offense to us some, somehow. Don't know why that is. I tell you what, you two meet, and then you come back, Mr. Black, and tell me there's no Satanism. If you can read. If, you, if you're not dumb, right? Dumber than dumb. Because I can see it. The man is literally telling you from the deepest PR research, the highest brow, the one. This man had an organization, has an organization, that is developing the latest software to monitor all online conversations and, uh, you know, whatever, from tweets onwards. A deep penetration of the digital world to uncover conspiracy type, what they consider, you know, mad boogaloo stuff, and to find out what to do about it. And as I just said, their thesis is, you haven't satanically programmed them enough. In that Fabian thing, it says at the top, we'll tell you what power is and what equality is. He's telling you, you'll do as we say without, us, without you knowing that we're acting on your brain. It's the same old policy as before, but it's infinitely more deep. And sinister because they're working in the digital kingdom. They're working on the World Wide Web where you think you have ultimate freedom. And you don't. They're trying to corral you and they'll corral your children. And they're telling you to do it invisibly, which is the satanic aspect. Because I didn't give you right. Any more than in vaccinations, I give you the right to come and enter my body and tell me this is good for me. Well, that doesn't make any sense. If a, if a branch falls on my head and even severely cuts me or I have a severe injury on my leg, right? I have the choice to bandage it myself Right, fix it, or do it, bandage it, fix it, go home, or come over to the white coats and say, could you do surgery on me? I have perfect choice if it's a physical injury. 
Well, if it's an internal injury, you call it a disease, virus, or bacteria, the same rule applies. I come to you when I say I come to you, not when you come over to grab me and stick a needle in me, do you? Oh, yeah. If I have complete freedom over surgery and injury of the physical kind, that's because it's sovereign. My body's sovereign. And even I'm dripping from all pores, right? And every bone is busted. I still retain the, the you know, the, the sovereignty to say, um, uh, let me take me to hospital. The hospital doesn't come to me and say, right, mate, come with us. We're going to put a cast on your leg. I fucking say when you put a cast on my leg. How come the world hasn't worked on that? The fear porn then? They're lining up. They're shivering in fear when obviously there is no law on this planet that can violate your body body sovereignty. And you need to get you need to marshal the legal facts. Go get a lawyer. Do whatever it takes to find that fact. This is what rational people on our side do. They don't panic. They don't get histrionic. They don't run around like uh, 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 you know chewing the carpet like a hamster. They contact a lawyer, a constitutional lawyer, or whatever it may be, and they find out. And then when they have to deal with a you know a medical body or a doctor or a clinic, you don't deal with it yourself. You go, give me the name of your superior. My legal team or my legal representative will be in touch. Do you think they want that kind of person going public then so that millions of other people know how to do the same thing? Suddenly you won't get calls. There's your immunity. Suddenly you won't get picked on because I'll leave that guy because he don't bow down to me and he's bringing his freaking lawyers in. And the next thing we'll have the media here so they'll know all of us is a, a, a farce. You think that people don't have power? They have they have the ultimate power. These other buggers have control. Do you know how to outfence them? Do you know how to do the Aikido on them? Well, you better start fucking learning because you have tremendous power. You, they're not going to want to deal with you. They go just, you know, that's it. You're you're blanketed. They won't even come to your door anymore because they know you're a trouble fucking maker. But to even get to be a legitimate troublemaker, not running in the streets, but a true person who knows their legalese and can ask them and bulleted, pointed questions, send it by way of a law firm. What's in these vaccines? You know, all the things. You shouldn't. I shouldn't even have to mention all of this. I'm just doing it to stress the fact that in society, you do have rights and you do have power. Exercise it with extreme articulation and you'll see it serve you. And then you can go on. Now you're qualified to go on and, you know, work like Brian Gerrish does and others and David Noakes to help others in your community, right? But wild, uh, harebrained political action, you know, and all of this, I've always said from day one, people who followed me for years know this, forget politics, go legal. Forget politics, go legal. If you have to fight within this pigsty, choose legal over politics. Has anybody listened? So again, I can only reiterate what we've said in the past because I haven't changed on any of these points. And anyone focused on your personality, David, or my personality, they are gate crash this party, baby. And you can get the hell out real quick or I'll put you through the fucking window. You do not belong. Right? So there is satanic stuff going on. They're not even hiding it anymore. Merkel didn't hide what she was doing when she brought in the hordes. She actually told us, I don't care about whether the Syrian or Palestinian or whoever. Why didn't we learn from that? What does that mean? Right? And these 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 PR people are saying, would you like to see the patents we've got for fucking with your mind? Would you like to see that? Come over anytime you want. We'll have tea and coffee too. Anytime you want, just come over and we'll show you how we're fucking with your minds. Right here, there's a lot of patents. You think they're hiding anything from us? Do you really know what mind control really is? It's when you get into lockstep with your master because you ain't worked it out in here. Because you're a fucking constitutional moral inferior. And you'd be led by the nose by even a far lesser tyrant than that. We're talking about the top level stuff. Fuck's sake, you'd fall at the first hurdle <clears throat> of, of any any witch doctor, as they are. Bill Gates gets up, man with no legal power whatsoever, and everybody's screaming and running around the fucking you know carpet, chewing the carpet, climbing the walls. Is that the Constitution? Then is that it? Is that what you got? Is that what you call Constitution? Unbelievable unbelievable ignorance and unbelievable you know, so but i'm a person who has no problem starting at the beginning see i don't get that i'm frustrated by it and i show that anger you know i show that healthy blue flame of anger but i have no problem as a person character logically of going right back to the nursery level and say let's start again because i'm excited i'm interested in that i've done it myself umpteen times in order to learn because i ain't got no high, uh, high iq and all of that i have gone through the slog way of doing it to which there are many uh, uh, advantages by the way 
right? I'm in the snail, not the hare. But I've done it. I reached. No, I reached where I needed to get to. So I have no problem actually going right back to say, let's take it up again from first principles, you know, right from the start. Not a problem doing that at all. And and if other people end up having to do it, it's all good, you know, because I, I understand there's a, you know, a flow between the ones who really, really got it quickly because they got the IQs and you don't need to say it twice. But there's people, you know, down the line who need it reiterated again, some of the first principles. And that's perfectly, perfectly all right. And that's what we did today, you know, in this little sketch of the kind of edifice that exists behind what people would call the communist revolution and BLM is part of that. The Muslim Brotherhood are part of that, right? This thing extends a lot further. Feminism is part of that. Your Democratic Party is merely a capsule of that. So in our discussions, we've always harped on that, you know, maybe this won't be the last, but again, thanks a lot for the time to be able to do this and get that across. But people go over to UK column, you know, listen to what the great Brian Garish is talking about. It's a really good source like Tucker Carlson is of uh, proper in news, which will help you fight and get empowered. A lot of really good stuff over there and support their website and support us as well. You know, it, it, it uh, it's vital. Wow. Just wow. I hope you guys heard what this man is saying. It's incredible. I'm with you all the way, Michael, and you're welcome on this channel anytime. You know that. And I just wanted to add a little bit to what you were saying. Go check out Brian Garish and all of that. Go check those links and then add this link to the pot to really dive into what Michael was just breaking down. Go look up this term, captology. It starts with a C. Captology is the study of computers as persuasive technologies. I'll just leave it at that and I'll let you go down that rabbit hole. But that's just more evidence of the same kind of technologies they're using to fuck with your mind. And if you don't control your own mind, someone else will. So if you're, if you're happy with that and you're cool with that and you want to look at people like us as being crazy uh, because we're not cool with that, well, I'll leave you to it. Um, I personally don't trust known liars and criminals. I personally want to control my own mind, and I hope every single one of you watching wants to do the same. Uh, it's, des it's desperately needed now more than ever. So um, thank you, Michael. Uh, we're going to do some more on Unslave. We've got Chance coming on on Sunday to do more of a deep dive into the occult side of uh, technology and video games and all that kind of stuff. It's a fascinating story to tell. Um, some fan really, really good stuff we've been cracking out at Unslaved. You can get it all at unslaved.com. And I've also got some other really fantastic guests uh, coming on this show as well. So stay tuned here. Thank you all for your, uh, your kind donations, your support, your amazing commentary. Great stuff going on in the chat today. And I will catch you very soon here on Truth Warrior. Cheers, everybody.